Heavenly Father, we now come before you, who is able to strengthen us according to the gospel of your grace and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of truth disclosed in the scriptures, and by the Holy Spirit's power to bring about the obedience of faith in each of us. May you do so this morning. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. My theme is the obedience of faith, and my title is Faith Working Through Love. For at least 50 years now, a great battle has been waged among so-called evangelicals concerning the nature of saving faith. And that battle is still ongoing. Too many church leaders acting like shady hucksters are teaching that the essence of faith is this. Come to Jesus. It will cost you nothing. The price has all been paid. It will cost you nothing. Now, like all good lies, acting or, or this, there is some truth to this statement, but there is also much falsehood to it. These ministers claim that if a person simply prays a prayer stating belief in Christ as Savior, he's saved even though he does not later exhibit any subsequent confirming evidence that his faith is genuine. According to this view, no repentance is required. No obedience to God needs follow. The person can continually and habitually sin and still claim to be saved. He or she can even later on become an atheist. But if he has previously professed faith in Christ, he remains eternally saved. Brothers and sisters, that is a dangerous falsehood. There is always a price connected with salvation and with discipleship. Yes, God's saving grace is free. No doubt about that. No one in the whole wide world can make any payment whatsoever to God for the forgiveness of his own sins and for regeneration. However, those who stand in the historic Protestant understanding of biblical truth correctly state that we are justified and saved by faith alone, but that such faith, if it is genuine, inevitably and inexorably produces a life of growth in godliness characterized by an active, ongoing obedience to Jesus as Lord. So this debate about the nature of saving faith is not inconsequential, since it concerns the heart of the gospel message in each of our eternal destinies. To that end, we will consider, are we justified by faith alone? Are second, saving faith submits to Christ. Third, Faith obeys Christ out of love. Fourth, Christ our authority. Fifth, the blessing of obedience. And finally, some concluding remarks. Point one, we begin by affirming that we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. Romans 5 verse 1 states, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification by faith is one of the greatest realities that the Book of Roman teaches us. In the end, we will each stand before God the judge in his courtroom, and he will either acquit or condemn us. If God acquits us, his acquittal will be based on his prior declaration that we have been already made alive in Christ, already been declared righteous in his sight. No amount of good works or keeping of the law can regenerate the heart. That is God's work. The Apostle Paul boldly declares that we are justified by grace alone through the righteousness of Christ alone freely imputed to us. Christ took all our sins upon himself and imputed to us, his righteousness, his perfect divine righteousness. And so we are now justified before God if we are in Christ. We need not fulfill the moral law of God in order to justify ourselves by a legal righteousness of our own. 
it is impossible. This is a wonderful truth. For the indictment against each of us was that we are unrighteous, morally bankrupt. There is no one righteous, not even one, says Romans 3.10. We are Ill, each guilty as charged. Yet the omniscient God, our judge, despite all of our sin, declares us not only to be not guilty as charged, but we are in fact found righteous. How can this be? How can God justify the ungodly and yet remain a just judge? One way to describe Paul's answer is to uh, put it in three steps. First, we must trust in Jesus alone as the ground and basis of our justification and not rely on any supposed good we have done or will do. We are by nature evil in God's sight until God gives us a new nature. So we are saved solely because of the work of Christ on our behalf, the fact that his work is perfect, and we cling to that truth by faith, knowing our complete inability to save ourselves. This is what Romans 5.1 means when it says, we have been justified by faith. Second, through this faith, Jesus alone, as the sole ground and basis of our justification, through this fact, we are united to Christ. We are in union with him. Romans 8, 1 declares that there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The key phrase is in Christ Jesus. In Christ, there is no condemnation. Through faith, we are united to Christ, and united to Christ, we are fully, completely, totally justified before God. Third, in Christ, the perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed by God to us. Thus, when God declares that we are righteous, there is a real basis for it in the righteousness of Christ. This is not a charade. 2 Corinthians 5.21 declares, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our sins were imputed to Jesus, and his righteousness is accounted to us. Thus the divine judge sees two things. First, that Christ suffered in our place and paid the full price for the penalty of our sin. And second, that we have been declared righteous in Christ. How then does our obedience relate to our justification? Well, consider Romans 5.20 and its connection with chapter 6. Here Paul says, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace imputes the gift of Christ's righteousness to us. It secures eternal life for us. But this wonderful radical doctrine in the minds of some people unleashes an erroneous thought. Well then, they say, let's sin all the more that grace may abound. They claim that if Christ is my righteousness, it doesn't matter then what I do. To this, the Apostle Paul emphatically declared, certainly not, may it never be. While it is true that but it is by grace alone that God counts us righteous because of Christ's righteousness, it doesn't follow that our subsequent obedience is irrelevant. Grace saves, but grace also reigns in righteousness. That's why Paul wrote Romans chapter 6 through 8. All of us who would have Christ as our Savior must also be willing to have him as our Lord. While we're not saved by obedience, we are saved, however, to obey Jesus as Lord. Second, saving faith submits to Christ. The Puritan Thomas Watson coined the phrase, true faith is obediential. So again, we must ask, how does our Obedience, the obedience of faith, relate to our salvation? The answer is this. Our obedience is not the ground or basis of our justification, 
nor is it in any part the instrumental means by which we're united to Christ. Faith alone unites us to Christ, and Christ alone is the ground of our justification. But obedience to Christ is the fruit of that faith. Heidelberg Catechism 86, question 86 asks, since we've been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? And the answer is because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also restoring us by his spirit into his image so that with our whole lives we may show that one, we are thankful to God for his benefits, two, that he may be praised through us, three, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and four, so that by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. Similarly, the Westminster Shorter, our, our Westminster Confession of Faith, Article 19.7 states, that this use of the moral law in the life of a Christian is not contrary to the grace of the gospel, but sweetly complies with it. And we could say complies with it as the rule of faith, the indwelling Holy Spirit subduing and enabling our wills to freely and cheerfully do that, do that which is the will of God revealed in the law. Thus, our obedience to God as Christians is not evidence of us being under the moral laws and means by which we are to be saved. No, it is evidence of our having been born again by God's spirit and of God's saving grace reigning in our hearts. Many people object to this, however, citing in a misunderstood way, citing their understanding of the liberty of conscience, that we are simply as Christians, free to do as we choose. They misunderstand what liberty in Christ is. So the Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 20, article one continues, the liberty which Christ has purchased for believers under the gospel consists in their freedom from the guilt of sin, the condemning wrath of God, the curse of the moral law, and in their being delivered from this present evil world, bondage to Satan, and the dominion of sin, from the evil of afflictions, the sting of death, the victory of the grave, and everlasting damnation, but also, and now hear this, also in their free access to God and their yielding obedience unto him, not out of slavish fear, but out of a childlike love and willing mind. So while Christ has delivered us from our bondage to sin and Satan, we are to be Christ's faithful bond slaves, gladly doing whatsoever he commands. If your faith in Christ is not produced in you the desire to love and obey Jesus as Lord, you don't have genuine saving faith, obedience, not perfection, but rather a new direction of thought and aff affections and behavior is the fruit that demonstrates that your faith is alive. James, the brother of Jesus, put it this way. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. It is always accompanied by a newness of life, Romans 6, 4. The purpose of obedience and good works for the Christian isn't to save us, but to demonstrate a change of nature within us. A.W. Tozer once noted, the idea that God will pardon a rebel who hasn't given up his rebellion is contrary to both scripture and common sense. Thus, the Westminster Confession of Faith, section 19.6 tells us that although true believers are not under the moral law as a con covenant of works to keep in order to be thereby justified or condemned. Yet the moral law is of great use to us in that as a rule of life, it informs us of the will of God and our duty towards him. We are justified 
in order that we might be gradually, ongoingly sanctified. And that means increasingly conformed to the image of Christ and to his holy law. The Holy Spirit enables us and prompts us to obey God's commands, thus leading us into righteous living. If there is no sanctification in your life, there never was any justification. Before coming to Christ, you were a goat, but now you have been made one of Christ's sheep. So live like one. Again, we boldly declare that true faith in Jesus as Savior then obeys him as Lord. One of the important aspects of becoming a Christian is to recognize the rights of God as our God and to live our lives according to the rules he establishes for us to live by. Jesus is not a figurehead king like King Charles III of the United Kingdom. No, Jesus reigns, he rules, he issues decrees through his word and his delegated under shepherds that he expects his people to obey. If God commands a duty, even though it is contrary to our likes and desires, the likes and desires of our own nature, we are to obey anyway. Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. If there are no good works, as defined by God, that you are, have done and are doing, you are not God's workmanship. In Matthew 21, 6, we read, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. Obedience to Jesus must mark the life of every true disciple of Christ. True saving faith produces a life of good works. And the most fundamental good work appointed for us to do as Christians is to obey God in whatsoever he commands us, Matthew 28, 20. If a person professes to believe, but there is scant evidence of his submission to King Jesus, his faith is not genuine. The apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, 19 through 22, Jesus was put to death in the body, but made alive by the spirit through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. To those who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through, the, through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. And while this passage is in some ways a, a most serious or mysterious assertion about what Jesus did after his resurrection and before his ascension, it is, however, clear as to Jesus' authority to govern. The spirits to whom the resurrected Christ somehow preached were those who long ago disobeyed. Their fate stands in stark contrast to that of those whose baptisms have uh, portrayed that they have died to sin and have been raised by the Holy Spirit to live a new life of faithful submission to Christ as Lord. Peter insists that just as the ark saved Noah's family so that they might serve God, the Holy Spirit also uses the waters of baptism to equip God's sons and daughters to live a new life of wholehearted submission to Christ's lordship. Thus, in keeping with Paul, uh, Peter's earlier call to Christians in 1 Peter 3.15, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. James echoes that in James 2, 17 to 19. Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there's one God? Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. 
In our day, there are masses of people who claim to believe in Christ, but who have no resulting godly change in their behavior. They think they are saved, when in fact, they are not. If the, if the call to make Jesus Lord isn't a strong enough motive for you to live biblically, then you don't know Jesus at all. Since eternity is writing on this matter, it's crucial to understand then what biblical faith is, for we should shudder at Jesus' words, the words that are familiar to many of us, is found in Matthew 7, 21 and following. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father is, uh, uh, the, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? What then shall I say to them? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. How often it will be for people to hear those words. For God is speaking of people who not only claim to be believers, but also claim to have been serving Christ. They thought they knew him, but Jesus didn't know them. To make sure that none of us hears Jesus' words of rejection, when we come to stand before him as judge, we must be clear on what the Bible teaches about saving faith, namely that saving faith is an obedient faith. Third, saving faith obeys Christ out of love. What does obedience have to do with love, you may ask? Well, the Amplified Bible translates John 14, 15 this way. If you, in parentheses, really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. This verse is followed by John 14, 21 to 24, and 31, and John 15, 10, which read, whoever has my commandments and obeys them is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. But the world must learn that I love the father and that I do exactly what the father has commanded me. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. It's easy to think of loving Jesus merely in sentimental terms, but such emotion must always be connected to keeping his commandments, or it isn't love at all. Disobedience to Jesus is a failure to love him as Lord and follow him as shepherd, those who love Christ will obey him immediately, exactly, and joyfully because this reflects their new regenerated nature. If you habitually disobey or willfully ignore Christ's commands, your obedience shows that he is not your shepherd. If you don't love him enough to walk in his paths of righteousness, he is neither your savior or your Lord. Refuse to obey Jesus as Lord shows you remain under the devil's control. Consider Romans 6, 15 through 18, which says, What then? Shall we, continue, or shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that when you offer yourselves as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? whether you are slaves to sin leading to death or to obedience leading to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you, were, that you once were slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were committed. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So we must reject this heresy among us that we can have Jesus as Savior without having him as Lord. 
When a man or woman believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he or she must love Jesus for all that he is and without reservation. Fourth, Christ our authority. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 states, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. The question must be asked, who is Jesus that we should obey his commands? Well, first and foremost, he's eternal God. And as such, we clearly owe him our most devoted honor and obedience. Only an incorrigible rebel allied with God's arch enemy, the devil, will continue to disrespect Jesus by refusing to obey him as Lord. Second, Jesus is God the Father's ambassador and sent delegate, sent to the world of sinful human beings. Only a rebel who hates God the Father will refuse to receive Jesus Christ and thus dishonor God the Father by dishonoring Jesus. Third, Jesus has been declared Lord. Yes, he came to earth in humiliation by becoming a man to live among us and to die on the cross for our sins, the sins of his people. But after his physical resurrection from the dead, Jesus was exalted on high. He ascended into heaven and is presently seated at God the Father's right hand. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given him as the crown for his own obedience in fully carrying out the mission God the Father tasked him with. The Apostle Paul, in speaking about Jesus in Philippians 2, starting with verse 9, wrote, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Elsewhere in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 20, Paul wrote, I pray also that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he, was ra- when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and every title that can be given not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, the one to whom an office is duly committed must have sufficient power and wisdom to discharge that office. So the charge that God the Father Uh, gave to Jesus to govern heaven and earth is given to Jesus who has that power innately to govern. Jesus is invested with and rightfully exercises both his divine authority and power. He also does so as the resurrected God-man in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. My point is that Jesus is the Lord God who is to be obeyed. Refuse to obey him and his proof you don't love him. And such unloving rebellion against him is not a very smart idea. So why then do you think people believe they can have Jesus as their savior without having him as their Lord? It simply doesn't make sense. First, such thinking is a product of these people's own innate sinful predisposition and hatred toward God and his rule over them. Such a mindset willfully misinterprets scripture. For example, Romans 10, starting in verse 16 says, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news, the Israelites being religious people. Not all the Israelites accepted the good news, for Isaiah says, the Lord 
Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and mes the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. From this passage, antinomians claim that you, if you simply accept the gospel call by praying a prayer of confession of sin and of faith, that is by asking for God's forgiveness and asking Jesus to save you, you're automatically saved regardless of whether you then manifest a Holy Spirit wrought change in your inner nature that now God loves, that now loves God and loves God's commands. Oh, how wrong they are. The question needs to be, what does the text itself say? The word Paul used for accepted in Romans 10, 16, hupe kusan, means to hear under, to heed, to obey. It is a hearing accompanied by such power that it leads you to submit to it, to that which you hear. Thus, Paul uses the word for accept to differentiate between a mechanical hearing and a true hearing, between simply hearing the words with your ears and hearing and embracing the word in your heart. There is a God-given ability in a real Christian's auditory hearing that humbles and subdues the person and renders him or her willing to submit to God's authority and obey Jesus as Lord. So look at the verses that follow. Romans 10, 21 says, but concerning Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate uh, people. In other words, to a people who refuse to love and obey God. So then the word acceptance of the gospel in verse 16 must mean that if you are truly born again, you no longer continually or continue living a disobedient life to God by stubbornly continuing to sin. If we're truly born again by the Holy Spirit, there must be both a ceasing to be disobedient and obstinate toward God and his government, coupled with an active obedience to him as God and Lord. Consider Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And Paul's command here, too, is often misunderstood. The main verb in verse 12 is to work out your own salvation. But does that mean we're to save ourselves by our own good works? No, it doesn't. Just as we've seen, the Bible clearly teaches elsewhere, we're saved, justified by faith alone, not by the works of our own merits. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is clear, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So then, what does Paul mean in Philippians 2, 12 by telling us to work out our own salvation? The Greek verb rendered work out means to continually work to bring something to completion or fruition. We know that this involves obeying God since it's parallel to the word in Philippians 2.12, just as you've always obeyed. So now work out your own salvation. So this unique remark speaks of ongoing, the ongoing obedience of those who are already saved. It's crucial to note that Paul is not telling them to work for their salvation. Rather, this statement is stating the need to live out, to practice and demonstrate the salvation which a true believer already has in Christ. That is what we would call sanctification. Certainly God knows we cannot do this on our own. So Paul in Philippians 2.8 tells us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works or is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Notice that it's God who works in you, works in the Christian. He not only works in us, but he works to change our wills. God isn't up in heaven saying, if you can just muster the will to obey, then I'll step in and help you finish the work. 
No, even your ability to obey, your willingness to obey, comes from him. So if you're struggling with this desire or lack of desire to obey God, then pray. Pray with the psalmist from Psalm 119.36. Turn my heart toward your statutes. Meaning, oh God, make me disposed to obey your word. God's work is primary. Every work of obedience you do happens because God is at work in you. And yet at the same time, it is really you doing the work God has ordained for you to do. God acts in us, and yet it is we who obey him. Thus, Paul in Romans 16, 19 commends those in the Roman church for their obedience. He repeated this same thought later in the same chapter, verse 26, when he declared that the gospel preaching is meant to bring the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. So while some false teachers and preachers may argue that exercising initial saving faith is all the obedience that Paul is speaking about, and that any subsequent obedience to Jesus as Lord is optional, a mere nicety, and not a requirement, they are simply wrong. People who live that way are stillborn babies. They are without a Holy Spirit wrought new life. God is not working in them. A good test to see whether or not a person really has saving faith is to look at his or her life. Is he or she being positively changed in a moral sense? Or do they give mere intellectual assent to the gospel, what we would call mere lip service. Consider 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exile, uh, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ. God's elect people are chosen to be obedient to Jesus. Does this characterize you? Or do you refuse to submit to God, to Christ, to obey him? Jesus Christ is our only Lord to the degree we submit to his lordship. This means, that making, this means making Jesus Lord of every area of your life. Are you attempting to limit his authority in some area of your life? If so, then repent and embrace Jesus as your functioning Lord. Consider Romans 16, starting with 24. Now to him who's able to strengthen you by my gospel and by the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery concealed in ages past, but now being revealed and made known through the writings of the prophets by the command of the eternal God in order to lead all nations, peoples from everywhere in the globe to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. John Piper wrote about this. If the glory of the only wise God through Jesus Christ is the ultimate goal of all things in these verses then the obedience of faith is next to the ultimate goal of all things in these verses. And that's because when faith in Jesus Christ produces obedience to Jesus Christ, those obedient lives make God look glorious. Does your life make God look glorious? Point five, the blessings of obedience. Jesus pronounces a blessing on those who obey him. In Luke 20, or 11, 28, he wrote, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Pastor Matthew is fond of saying, Respect, respond, and receive a blessing. You must obviously respect Jesus as Lord if you are to obey him as Lord. If you do not respond to him in obedience, it shows you have no respect for him. No respect for his person as God, no respect for his office as savior, no respect for his kingship. But if we do respond to him in obedience, he promises a blessing. 
In 2 Kings 18, 3 and 5 through 7, we're told about King Hezekiah. He did what was right in the eyes of God. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among the kings of Judah, either before or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept to the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. Perhaps you've hesitated to obey God because you fear the worldly consequences of your decision. You're afraid of what the world around you, what people around you may think about you. But you should know that the same sovereign, omnipotent God who keeps your heart beating, who keeps the planets orbiting the sun, is more than able to keep you in your situation. When he tells you to do something, then you need to obey based solely on who he is. When you choose to obey him, know he promises to bless you. You do not un need to understand why God is asking you to do a certain thing. You need just to trust and obey. He will reward you with his favor and a sense of inner peace and joy that far outshines anything the world has to offer you. So in conclusion, Jesus said, your faith has saved you. We are not supposed, or, uh, we are not uh, told anywhere that our good works save us. God's unconditional election of a person means God does not foresee some supposed good behavior on anyone's part that then induces God to save that person. Rather, election rests on God's independent, sovereign decision to save whomsoever he pleases to save. But having been saved through faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ's atoning work alone, the resultant living faith will then animate us to do the good works God has ordained for us to do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that it's one thing to say, Lord, Lord, and quite another thing to obey your commandments. Give each of us a new heart to love and obey you. Thank you that Christ died for our sins and rose again to give us his new resurrected life and the power of the Spirit, that we might love Christ as Lord and obey his commands out of that love. O oh Lord, may we happily trust in Christ and happily walk in the obedience that he has placed in our hearts to do. May we each be able to say this day, Welcome, happy morning. Age to age shall say, Hell today in my heart is vanquished, and heaven is won today. Amen. Amen.